Okay, welcome to the eighth and final part of the Index DB series. In this one, we're going to be talking about cursors. So, what is a cursor and how do you use them? Well, what a cursor is, if you can imagine that you've done a query, you get back a record set, so you've got an array of objects. The cursor would be getting those records one at a time. So, similar to what you would do with a for of loop and an iterator. You're getting one value at a time, and when you want the next one, you say, okay, give me the next one. But in the meantime, you work with the current value. You can evaluate and decide what you want to do with it. With a cursor, in addition to that, you can also specify, I want to go through the array forwards or backwards. I want to skip over values that aren't unique. And I can do that going forwards or backwards. So you get the direction and you get the ability to manage things one at a time. So let's take a look in our code here. All I'm going to be editing in this one is going to be the build list function. So originally what we did was with the store, we called the get all function. So that was number one. Now we could have done store, we could have done index, but that was the later one. When we do get all, we can provide a key or a key range to that. The second one that we did, this was in the last video, we talked about indexes and key ranges. So we could run the query get all, same as the get all for the store, except we're doing it on an index. So once we have the store, we select an index and then we do the loop it through it that way. Either one, whether it's on the store or on the index, we were using the same on success function and we just took all the results and we looped through them using the map method to write out the list items. So I've commented all of that out on the web page. We can see down at the bottom, I've just got that little loading message. I am, I'm not loading any of the data. I'm going to use a cursor to do that. So down here, what I'm going to do, first of all, we do have the line for the store here. We still have that. So I'm going to use the store and I'm going to use an index. So we'll say let index, that's going to be my variable, equal to store.index. And which one do we want to use? Well, I'm going to use the name. We can look at things um, alphabetically that way. I could have used any of the indexes. The cursor doesn't have to be tied to uh, just strings. It can be numbers, whatever you want. And the range, I'm going to set a range on this to say I want to get back I'm um, sorry, the bound method. And we can say starting at what, ending at what. I could use lower bound to say just from this on or upper bound to say anything up to this. When we're dealing with strings, this is going to be case sensitive. So that's important to note. And that means the uppercase letter come first, followed by the lowercase letters. If you want to specify that you want upper or lower, you may have to do two queries to do that uh, if it's a range within that. So I know that all of my names inside of here, if we look at this, uh, yep, we're on the name index. These are all starting with an uppercase letter. So I can use just the uppercase letter. And let's say I'm going to go from the letter J up to the letter M. So I'm going to just get these two Lagavulins. So starting at J, going up to M, and we can say false to include them. It's not going to make any difference whether we say false or true with this index. But that's going to give me my range. I'm going to clear out my list. And this is in the HTML. So I'm getting rid of this loading item right here. I'm going to replace that in here with the values coming from my cursor. Now, there is a direction that I can provide. The default value for it is going to be next, but we could say next, next unique, previous, or previous unique. Any one of these strings I can use as the direction. I'll do one without the direction first, and then we'll come back and add one in. So we're going to say open cursor. And then it wants some one of these values to use as a query. So I can provide my range. I can put in a key. I'm going to put my range inside of here. This is 
that range of letters. If I wanted the direction, it's the second thing, but I'm going to leave it as the default right now for the um, next. And I'm just going to chain my on success onto this. All right. Now, when I get the on success, what that means is I now have the first record. So this success function only runs for one record at a time. My cursor is going to be ev.target.result, which in the previous examples up here, result was the array that we were looping through. But now the result is the cursor. It's this representation of the one record plus the ability to skip to the next one. If there are nothing, if there's no records that match what we've done, or if we've already looped through all the records, we're going to get undefined. It's going to be finished. So this if statement isn't going to run if there's no more records left. So I'm going to add an else on here. You don't normally have to do this, but I'm going to put an else and say end of cursor. And inside of here, for each one of them, I can write out a few values. We've got access to a whole bunch of things. So we've got object store name. That would be my whiskey store. There's the cursor dot source dot name. Oh, sorry, this should be source dot object store. Inside the source object, we've got the object store to say, this is the name of the store that I got the data from. Cursor source name, not object source name, but just name. This is going to depend on whether you used the index to access it or whether you use the store. So this could be the name of the store. It could be the same as this, or it could be the name of the index. Um, we've got cursor dot direction. That's going to give us, in this case, the default next to tell us which way we're going through the records. Cursor dot key. This is going to be dependent on which index we're using, what the key is. And cursor dot primary key could be the same as key if you were using the store. There we go. So we've got all these different things that we can write out each time we're going through. So I'm just going to run it once just like that, just to see these messages come up. Okay, so we haven't built anything here. We cleared out the old HTML, but in the console, there we go. There's the name of the store. There's the name of the index. There's the direction we are moving. This is the key, and this is the primary key. Now, I only got one record. And that's because that's what the cursor does. It runs one time. And if you don't do anything with it, as soon as you sort of get to the end of this success function, the transaction says, oh, all right, I guess we're done. And the transaction will commit and everything will be finished. If you want to continue, if you want to keep going, you have to call the method continue. Now, this will actually call on success again. So it's going to trigger the success event. There we go. Now I have two times that I'm going through and the third time I'm getting to the end of the cursor. So continue goes back to try and get the next record again and again and again. There were only two that matched and that's because of my range. I was only going to get the letter L's. And so let's add it here. Let's make it display it in the HTML so we can see it coming up. So we're going to set the inner HTML. Oh, and we need to get the value out of there. I'm going to put it into a variable. The cursor, in addition to all these things, has a value property which represents the object, the record that you're getting out. So I'm going to put it inside of whiskey, and then I can use the same HTML that I did here. So we'll take the HTML and we'll add on the same thing. So we'll save that. And there we go. We got the two records coming up. 
Now with the direction, we're currently using the default next. If I change that to next unique, this value right here, we'll add it in as the second argument. Save that. We only ever get one because there are no more unique values for the key, Lagavulin. If we change this, let's say I put, I don't know, the letter C, but in lowercase, it's going to go from J in the uppercase all the way to the end of the uppercase and then start here and continue on. So I'll get anything in the alphabet that is after J. And there we go. I've got Oban. So that is the next unique value in this cursor. Let's change this to go from A to Z. So anything in there, anything's fine. I could have left the range out, but I'm going to say this is my range. Anything that starts with A to Z. And I'm going to change the direction to previous. Now, this order right here, this is actually the reverse of what we have inside of here. So it's starting with the last one and it's going back up through here. If I changed it to the previous unique, as you can imagine, it will give me the Oban first, then the Lagavulin 8, and then the Crown Royal. It'll skip over this other one. So Prev Unique, it's just going backwards through the entire record set. I guess it gave me the 16 first. Not sure why it did that one. If it went from here, I would be expecting it to do this. Check it going the other way. Oh, we got the 16 that way. I guess it's because in the original one, based on the key, the 16 is coming before the 8, so it's using that as the next one. So it uses the, the key path, it uses the primary key when there are unique values, I guess, to, to sort them. Okay, well, that is how to use cursors, and that's it. Now, one thing I want to stress again, I know I mentioned it before, but one thing to stress about the cursors is they will end. They, you can't use them as an asynchronous tool. So you can't put a timed delay or say, okay, here's the first value. And when the user clicks, I'm going to give them the next one. And that's because of the, the transaction itself. It wants to finish as soon as possible. It doesn't want to be held up and be hanging on to the memory with that data. So if you do anything to cause a delay in here, the next time you cause the cursor, it's not going to work. So if I put this cursor continue inside of some sort of time delay, like a set timeout, it is not going to work because the transaction will already be called, uh, closed, committed, and then it will uh, just give me an error. It'll say, okay, I can't run this cursor because the store that it was connected to is no longer available. All right, and that's it. That is everything that you really need to build a full-fledged IndexedDB that you can use as part of a progressive web app or as just part of your regular websites. Um, there are lots of libraries that are available. Um, I did, back at the beginning of this series, I did a short video using uh, the IDB KeyVal library by Jake Archibald. He has another library called IDB, which is a great library for accessing all the features, not just treating it like local storage. Um, if you use that, the difference between what I've done here with this basic vanilla JavaScript and his is he's wrapped everything in promises. So it's it's a nice little way that you can use the chaining that you get with promises using then and catch to make your code a little bit more readable. You can see that I've got a fair bit of duplication. There's a lot of callbacks inside of here waiting for the events. You wouldn't have that if you were using a library. Um, his is not the only one. There's lots of libraries out there, but check it out when you get a chance. I will leave the link to that down in the description. All right. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. I'll answer as many as I have time for. And as always, thanks for watching.